We now move on to the third and final panel discussion of the day titled Beyond Transactions, the ever-changing relationship between asset managers and distributors. And while the panelists get mic'd up, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our partners for this summit. Title partner, Reliance Nippon Life Asset Management, powered by HDFC Asset Management, Associate Partners, Birla Sun Life Asset Management, and ICICI Prudential Asset Management, Webcast Partner, 24 Frames Digital. Also a kind request to kindly fill in the feedback forms. Those of you who haven't submitted them to the registration desk, they are in your delegate kit. Kindly fill them up and give them to the registration desk before you leave. And of course, you can Continue to tweet using the handle ET Mutual Fund, as also hashtag all about MF. It is my pleasure now to welcome on the dais the moderator for this panel, Mr. Jiju Vidyadharan, Director of Funds and Fixed Income Research. Crystal Research. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly put your hands together for Mr. Vidyadharan. I now call on the panelists one by one. Mr. Vishal Kapoor, CEO, IDFC AMC. Mr. Ravi Menon, CEO, HSBC Global Asset Management India. Welcome, Mr. Menon. Mr. Ashish Sumaya, CEO Motilal Oswal Asset Management. And Mr. Akshay Gupta, CEO India Bulls Asset Management. Warm welcome to all our panelists. Mr. Sandeep Sikka, the Executive Direct Director and CEO of Reliance Nippon Life Asset Management, who was supposed to be a part of this panel has been uh, unable to make it, so he will not be participating. transactions, the ever-changing relationship between asset managers and distributors. Over to you, Mr. Vidyadhar. Hello. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the previous session was really all about advertising. I can see that a uh, lot of uh, the people here are from the intermediation or the distribution community. And I'm sure... Uh, you know, this would be a topic, you know, that will interest a lot of you. In fact, I have on the panel uh, a mix, really a mix, I mean, you know, when I, when I say a mix, you know, we have people, uh, you know, like a Vishal, who has spent a good amount of time 
in the distribution space. We have Ashish uh, again, you know, uh, someone who has led sales, you know, for a very long period of time, uh, and also, you know, with Motila Loswal AMC, you know, someone, uh, an agency, you know, which works very strongly in the sub broker, uh, you know, model area, you know, which is also, you know, a, a key uh, area of growth, really, from a distribution perspective. Uh, we also have Ravi and Akshay, you know, who also bring with them, you know, their uh, share of experience uh, in the banking and uh, distribution space. Uh, to set the context, you know, if we actually look at uh, the way the mutual fund industry has evolved, you know, uh, very recently, uh, industry assets crossed the 15 trillion mark. Uh, what is interesting to note here is that uh, retail and HNI assets put together contribute about 50 percent of uh, the overall assets under management. And, uh, you know, if you were to look at, uh, you know, a lot of the literature you know, that's, that's put out on the huge potential, uh, clearly there's huge potential for, uh, you know, the industry to see greater penetration. I mean, today, uh, from the perspective of uh, household savings, if you were to look at it, only about 5 percent or less than 5 percent of household savings are invested in capital market uh, instruments, a part of which is really mutual funds. Uh, in terms of geographical penetration, I think, you know, this got covered in one of the previous sessions. Most of the assets that get mobilized uh, under mutual funds is really restricted to the top 15 cities. In fact, uh, the top five themselves contribute about 72 percent of the assets. And clearly, you know, there's a lot of scope in the B15 uh, segment and even uh, beyond that. Uh, what is also very important to note here is that the distributors have played an integral growth, integral role really in the way the industry has evolved. Uh, even with the advent of direct plans, you know, which today account for close to 35-40% of the industry assets under management, it is important to note that uh, distributors continue to play a very significant role. In fact, the share of distributors as a percentage of retail asset mobilization would be in excess of 90 percent. What we have also seen in recent times is a lot of changes, uh, you know, especially in the regulatory environment uh, in the intermediation space. There have been uh, measures such as, you know, one of course the introduction of direct plans, second caps on upfront commissions, changes in expense structures, a lot of talk really on distribution and advisory services seg segmentation between the two and disclosures of commissions. So these are a few of the changes, you know, that we have seen in recent times. Uh, intermediation or mutual fund intermediation, at least we believe today stands at the crossroads of change where traditional embedded uh, fee-based models are today being reviewed uh, for, uh, you know, greater advice, greater usage of technology. And uh, it is in this context you know, that uh, I think it would be important to really understand what are the dynamics, you know, that are going around in the distribution space today and how are uh, asset management companies uh, specifically really trying to address a lot of the challenges that are, that are there in the uh, intermediation space. I would uh, really want to begin uh, the discussion by requesting my, co my, my panelists to really spend about two minutes of time setting the context on, uh, on, on, on the topic uh, for the day, really. So maybe, Vishal, if we, if we could begin with you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, you. So I think at the outset, uh, first let's look at what's the nature and scope of the industry today uh, from a you know, 30,000 feet uh, view, if, if we could. We have an industry where the product itself is, I think we would all agree, quite proven now over more than two decades, very strong. Uh, results in terms of outperforming the benchmark quite significantly and thereby creating a lot of value for investors. So the product works. It's also got regulatory standards which I would call as among the best in the, in the world with levels of transparency, liquidity, daily NAV and features which are really second to none right. across the world. And therefore it is a moot point of despite having a great product and great infrastructure and great environment all, all around, why is it that we are not as penetrated in this beautiful product as the rest of the world? When I say penetrated, what I mean is most of the ratios that we look at, including 
mutual fund assets to GDP or mutual fund assets to other products like bank deposits. I think India lags significantly. You talked about just less than 5% of household savings being with mutual fund assets. So clearly there is a lot of potential for growth. And at the heart of, I guess, where the opportunity is, it is about how do we get the next new customer in to experience this new product, to benefit from it. And what we've seen over the two decades in the, in the past, most customers who've experienced this product tend to stay and build. So it's really more about how many new customers we can get in to experience this new, new product and benefit from it, which should be, therefore, uh, propagating this, this, this growth at a much, much faster rate. So I think that's the heart of the, right. the challenge as we see it. Right, I, I agree. I mean, it's clearly a product you know, which has uh, the numbers uh, in terms of performance to showcase. And it's really a matter of how do you really get a larger set of people into uh, experiencing uh, the, 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 the benefits, really. Ashish, you know, if we could have two minutes from you uh, with your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, so, is this working? Yeah, yeah, it is. So, you know, uh, what I've seen is a couple of things. When I started my career, uh, you know, talking about mutual funds to people, this was about 98, 99. And at that time, uh, you know, I used to meet a lot of rich people, and I used to tell them that, why don't you start investing in mutual funds? So, you know, typically in our country, there is one phrase uh, which works very well, which is, kitna degi. Hmm. So, at the end of a long conversation, the rich man would ask eventually, kitna degi. And we used to say, you know, something like, you know, nominal GDP growth, private sector, this, that. And, you know, eventually say that, okay, if you put money in an equity fund, over long periods of time, you know, you might get 12, 15% kind of thing. And then the rich man would say that uh, if I put money in a government of India relief bond, I'll get 12% risk free and tax free. So, you know, there is this adage in English, which is that habits change with generations. Yeah. And uh, in our country, what I've seen is that few years back, uh, there was no reason for people to put money in capital markets. Because if the government of India competed with us and offered uh, 10 and 11% risk free and tax free, then there was no need for uh, capital market products. So that is the first uh, great change which is happening now. Uh, and you know, sometimes we get very impatient with the growth of an industry, whereas the reality is that, like I said, things take time to change. And just to give perspective, in the first 20, 20 25 or 30 years, we had 75 lakh SIPs. Yeah. But in the last one year, we've added 25 lakh SIPs. So you know, a lot of times we talk about mutual funds as if it's a futuristic idea, and, but in reality, the future is here. I mean, it's already growing very rapidly. So I think it's a matter of time, you know, if we just, everybody, everybody in the industry, you just come to work at 9 in the morning, do a good job, go home at 6 o'clock, and don't do any adventures and don't make mistakes, we'll do a fabulous job. Sure. I think, uh, you know, uh, beside, I mean, one of the key points I think that came out, uh, Ashish, was this entire concept of fixed return, you know, that's, that's also, you know, one of the key uh, points, you know, that play out in an investor's psyche. Fact is uh, also that, you know, interest rates are going down. So, you know, we'll, we'll eventually see a scenario, in fact, we're already seeing that, you know, where uh, the bond yields are no longer at the 12% uh, sort of levels. Uh, sure. you know, so, yeah, that's a, that's a relevant point. Uh, Akshay, I mean, if, if we could have uh, some uh, points from you as well. <clears throat> Thanks to you. Uh, I think to me, the good news is that whatever my co-panelists, uh, Vishal and Ashish, have highlighted, it's the growth of the industry. It's been phenomenal. Uh, six years back, I was sitting in a similar forum hosted by another media company, and I think we were about six, seven lakh crores as an industry. And uh, the uh, moderator asked me, what do you think would be uh, the growth of the fund industry in the next five years, and I said probably three, four lakh crores more. So probably topple the 10 lakh crore mark. So I was off by almost five, six lakh crores. So that's the good news. The bad news is that you still have an awareness level, which is to me, nothing less than pathetic. Today, NCD issues are launched and closed within one or two days. Those are taxable instruments. Double A minus NCDs. I'm getting a little technical, but let me just quickly throw some facts. 
a double a minus ncd by a gold loan company closes a 500 crore issue in 3 days flat the biggest fund house cannot close 500 crores of fmp in a triple a fmp in 3 days flat so what does that clearly indicate i think it clearly indicates that we still haven't gone to distribution levels that one should i think the awareness levels of mutual fund as a product obviously because it's just a 20 year old product are far too low in this country and like ashish said rome wasn't built in a day it will take generations for habitual changes uh, i think we should all be patient increase the efficiency of awareness uptake amongst potential investors i keep the giving this example that my brother who's from IM Cal, uh, 24 years in, in, in industry, doesn't know the difference between A mutual fund and B mutual fund. And he says, man, SIP may invest here. You know, that is the kind of thing. So clearly, we, we don't, we have not made enough efforts. Uh, we don't even have investors distinguishing between products and processes. And these are IM Cal graduates. So, I mean, how bad can we get? And that is as an industry, whether it's the manufacturing industry or the uh, mutual fund association or the distribution industry within which you have banks, IFAs, whatever nomenclature you want to call them, I think we're all to take an equal blame. We haven't done enough to create awareness of the products. We have given far better returns. I don't know why this fuss about uh, decreasing commissions. 95% of our funds across the industry outperform the index by a huge margin. So I think we are very justified in charging whatever we charge and paying out to the distribution fraternity. Uh, so I think it's, to me, it's the increase of awareness that is critical to this industry. Sure. If at all this 5% savings and 15 lakh crores needs to double up, uh, the next level of takeoff will not come from the markets. Uh, you know, the tailwinds from the markets have helped the last 5 lakh crores. I think the next 15 lakh crores will come from awareness and advantages of mutual funds over other products. Sure. And, and in fact, I'll have a question at a subsequent stage on, uh, you know, the, the, the amount, you know, that is to be uh, kept aside for investor awareness initiatives and, you know, uh, how could intermediaries really play a role there. Uh, Ravi, if we could have, uh, you know, some thoughts uh, on uh, the topic. Yeah, I think uh, clearly we used the word 20 years of existence uh, with various definitions. Uh, yesterday was the Amphi AGM, and it was the 21st AGM. And I was thinking of the similarity between a 21-year-old adult and a 21-year-old industry. And it depends on our title for this afternoon on the changing relationship. So I think if you are a parent and you have a 21-year-old, uh, you always remind him that he's a young adult, but you never trust him to behave responsibly. If you are a 21-year-old and you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, she or he thinks of you as being the most mature person. So I think different perspectives from who you are. But looking at it from a distribution perspective, I think the success which the industry has achieved in a very short period of time is something which is truly commendable. I've spent perhaps more time in banking uh, rather than in asset management. And one tends to forget, just maybe 20 years ago, India's GDP itself was about 250, 300 billion dollars. When we reached a trillion dollars, it was a matter of celebration. We have crossed the two trillion mark and there's no, there's no fuss, we are now talking aspirationally much, much bigger numbers. As of end August, we as an industry are roughly $220 billion of assets under management, 10% of uh, GDP. If one takes a comparable competitor in financial services, which is bank deposits, it is roughly about 20% of bank deposits. But I think we all agree that we are at a tipping point, both as an economy, in terms of habits, cultural, We've spoken a lot about what I think is the most transformational habit, where the average citizen today 
is saving, is creating savings by investing. It's it's a it's a concept which is uh, you know very difficult to uh, to grasp. But I think when once one understands the enormity of that change, and that change has really come about by this perfect relationship collaboration between all four stakeholders, be it the regulator who very often is pilloried, the manufacturer who is you know perhaps also equally, but the distribution and your end investor. From our perspective, as a manufacturer and the relationship is a bit of a constant. We always believe that the distribution owns the end investor. Somewhere along uh, this journey of financial growth in the country, uh, one tends to get confused by the various models. Uh, should you own the customer? Should you own the product in terms of manufacturing? Should you own both? It's equivalent of an infrastructure highway. By virtue of ownership of the road, you don't necessarily say, now I'll also own the car and sell cars down that platform. So it's an industry which is trying to still find that level of maturity, which perhaps is too early in a 21-year-old existence. It still takes a bit of time, which takes me back to the previous speaker, Josie Paul, and he was speaking about a very subtle message, the whole issue of branding and recognition, and that identity and identification, be it big or small. You raised the question on, on the small man. But I can tell you one thing about Josie Paul, and I've known him for a long time, Maybe when he was 18 years old, he was a good South Indian uh, Malayali gentleman who used to wear a Nepali cap and a, a Nehru jacket at all times. No one asked him as to why is he dressed in that fashion. But somewhere along the way, he's now, he's, he's like the Salman Khan with the glasses at the back. But there's an identification almost immediately. The truth is, on the manufacturing side, and I think also on the distribution side, a large number of us have become very Me Too players. You take away a brand name and put X, Y, Z, it becomes almost difficult to distinguish between one player and the other. And I think all of you should also recognize the same thing lies with you. How do you distinguish yourself from the next advisor? What is the difference that you bring to your, inv to your investor community at this particular stage? And therefore, my belief is, whilst we are at a tipping point, but over the next 20 years, this market is going to expand. It's going to explode, I think. Unless each one of us identifies what is our strength, picks up that niche, identifies ourselves clearly with that aspiration of that particular investor, that will make a difference and really provide that specialization, which will then correct what I totally agree with you is the issue of financial literacy. The issue of financial literacy in asset management as opposed to bank, where we open Jandan Yojana schemes, where people don't have a bank account. Here today, people who have a bank account of substantial quantum and means are still illiterate. So it's got nothing to do with academics, education, or financial well-being. It's got to do with purely that awareness. And that is a collective responsibility which all of us have. And I think if we were to discharge that, this relationship which you mentioned will only strengthen from here. Sure, Ravi. I think, Ravi, you also, you know, briefly spoke about, uh, you know, the, the clear articulation of roles, you know, for the manufacturer. I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and also, you know, from the perspective of really appropriately using the distribution channel. Uh, so on, on those lines, I had a question, you know, which is, you know, it's all really at this point of time a matter of growing the pie. And, you know, when you're looking at growing the size of the pie, uh, both intermediation and disintermediation, you know, which is direct as well as, uh, you know, the distribution channel are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, and uh, what what is your sense on whether it is really trending in that manner, whether the environment is really trending in that manner, and if not, you know, what really needs to be done? Well, I think this is a discussion which we are having before, and this is uh, the nice niceties of English language, intermediation, disintermediation. Uh, one almost tends to forget what these words mean, because we are in banking, and then comes asset management. You'd say, here are my deposits which are going into financial assets and I've been disintermediated. There will be some financial innovation which will come in which will be a competitor, alternatives, etc., etc. But I think the key thing to remember, going back to my earlier point, is this pie is going to expand. Okay, your $2 trillion, we're all reasonably confident we've got a 7%, 8% GDP growth for a foreseeable future. You're talking very substantial amounts of GDP growth. So even if financial services, financial assets stay at this 5%, 
it is going to be a very substantial amount. So the numbers which were mentioned now at 16 lakh crores and I think the aspiration for industry is 30 lakh crores in a few years will definitely take place. But if the pipes of distribution remain where it is today, it is going to get clogged as would we with any form of infrastructure if, if something is going to get pushed under the existing pipes. So I'm just playing the role of the regulator's uh, sentiment looking to widen the pipes which are available. Some say digital, but digital is in its own way has always been direct in the past, only thing it was paper based. What is going to happen now is more mobile, I guess, and, and other platforms which are going to come in. Be it a manufacturer, be it a distributor, I think none of us have a choice. We'll have to embrace each one of these. Perhaps as manufacturer becomes easier in, in some of the investment capabilities that we can make, but the cost of technology, and I think there was an earlier session which was taking place, is providing that ability to all of us to deliver this in its own way. People say fintech is going to come in, but in its purest sense, fintech is taking advantage of the fact that both manufacturer and distributor is not making full use of that technology capability and is coming in in between and perhaps at this stage with this branding and ability to deliver on both sides is taking away the pipe from both manufacturer and distributor. The good thing of technology is you can miss one generation, which today means three years in a technology life cycle, but you can come back and pick it up immediately. So my view is this whole issue of intermediation or disintermediation is really going to translate, and I'm playing with words, a reintermediation again. That what we lose can come back fairly soon. Today with the, with the yield curve, as you said, uh, our yields are declining fairly dramatically uh, in Europe and the US where it rates at zero and one percent. How does an asset manager charge the fee uh, which is available in emerging markets? You just can't. But they still do to a limited extent, but there's enormous pressure. Which means perhaps people are saying, forget, I don't want to pay this. I'm going to go in, back into the banks. But the banks, on the flip side, in, in those markets, do not want those deposits. They're saying, please go back into asset management. In Japan, with negative interest rates, people are taking physical cash and storing physical cash. And today, a business model is if you've got a cash vault which is, can be leased out to investors, it's available. So who's intermediating, who's disintermediating is going to become so much more dynamic and all of this arising out of economic progress. As we progress and you know, improvements take place, there's going to be more and more challenges. But the good news is that the pie is going to get bigger and as long as we apply ourselves, I see a very bright future. Sure. Vishal, the, you know, the, one of the other central points of discussion in recent times is this entire concept of uh, incorporating advice and really looking at uh, charging uh, separately for advice. I mean, uh, you know, there is a discussion paper which is awaited uh, on uh, uh, moving out of embedded uh, advisory uh, in the traditional distribution model and really charging separately for advice. So, uh, you know, there is a significant amount of uncertainty also associated with uh, the investor really paying for the advice. I mean, typically, you know, you also uh, tend to believe that uh, investors don't really pay for research. Uh, where, how do you see this entire piece uh, moving and uh, what is the impact that you see, you know, from the perspective of penetration, you know, if, if this remains uncertain? Right. I think, uh, you know, one of the themes that we talked about just now was that the market is really big and wide. And in that market, not all customers are evolved at the same level, they're not at the same demographics, they're not in the same social environment, economic environment, etc. So to my mind, there is a market which can be segmented into very, very different uh, service models. And clearly, the two emerging right now seem to be one around embedded fees, which has been the traditional model in India for most financial products, and the other one, which is that I charge you for advice separately, and then, you know, once you have my advice, you can go directly to the manufacturer and then maybe get a cheaper product. Now, the latter is where clearly there is more transparency, but it's not as yet proven. So I guess as we evolve, and I think uh, the good news is that the regulators also talked about a time frame within which one will evaluate and evolve 
and let this settle down over a period of time. So that will be interesting to see of how that lands. Now clearly the advantage is that uh, it talks to the more evolved customer, someone who understands the value of advice, is willing to pay for it, very transparent, and in most cases will bring down the cost to the evolved customer. Many of these evolved customers will also be more affluent in nature, uh, although it's not necessary that only the affluent customer is more evolved, but they tend to be more affluent, which means that even if the, the percentage of margin is finer, the absolute amount for the advisor may still be quite large for you to make that a substantive model. But the bulk of the model today still is embedded distribution, and I think there's a very good reason why. You know, the challenge that we spoke about just now, about our penetration in the industry still being far away from global standards, in one sense comes down to awareness, and at the heart of it comes down to how many individuals are out there trying to get this awareness out. It's a communication problem, it's a distribution problem. Right? Now, in an environment where you need more and more people to go out and communicate the benefits of a great product to more and more people, we have to recognize this is cost resources. And I'd like for us to look at it as the individual, from an individual advisor standpoint, that if we cannot as an industry attract, uh, let's say a young graduate or someone who's professionally qualified, wants to take up a profession, and he's not or she is not looking at advice as a profession, we've got a fundamental challenge. This should be an attractive profession for someone who wants to get into this business to come through and build a business, or build, a, build a practice out of this. Now that's an economic model that we've got to, I think, resolve. And I see, therefore, to some extent, the distribution model requiring a bit more time to expand and, and grow the market, given the need for awareness building, given the need for simplicity in communication, while the transition actually happens, more, I would think, at the, at, at the affluent plus end, more, maybe more in the urban environment, uh, for customers who are now slightly more evolved, because they might have been doing this now for a few years. Sure, sure. Uh, it's a very interesting point, uh, Vishal, that you spoke of just segmentation uh, on the basis of the investor. And, and on those lines, Ashish, I wanted to check uh, in the retail space, uh, you know, there's the, the IFA channel becomes very, very critical, you know, because the personalized touch also, you know, is a very material factor, you know, when it comes to influencing uh, retail investments. Uh, so, you know, we, we also have various, uh, you know, models such as the sub-broker uh, uh, model, you know, that, that we see. We also have a lot of platforms. Increasingly, we are also seeing exchanges becoming, uh, you know, quite prominent in the distribution space, again, targeting primarily at the IFA uh, channel. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How, what do you think will, uh, you know, be the preferred option, uh, really, for the IFA channel, especially the ones who are really targeting, you know, the retail space, really? and primarily in the B15 uh, sort of uh, cities uh, to really look at. Uh, See, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of times when somebody speaks about, let us say, a platform or about a fintech solution or about, uh, say, IFAs as a channel standalone, uh, in, in our mind there are different channels, but I don't think consumers see it that way. Uh, I mean, I have enough experience for me to actually conclude that a lot of times consumers may end up filling a form and cutting a check and the application will come through a channel partner right. uh, who you could say is an IFA, but uh, the research could be done by reading, uh, you know, say ETIG or uh, some other source of information or it could be based on something you read on some other medium. So as a manufacturer, if you ask me, uh, I understand that I need my presence to be all across. Now, coming to your question on, uh, let us say, independent financial advisors, I think there is a lot of hue and cry made about whether people will use, in the same vein like I was saying, a lot of hue and cry about whether people would prefer to use technology and with the so-called onslaught of technology, is it that the face-to-face -face channels will face a threat? Now, I think that just because there are more and more smartphones coming and just because people are buying uh, clothes and shoes and phones on e-commerce platforms, 
doesn't mean that they'll be comfortable making financial decisions and buying an investment product uh, on the platform. So I don't believe that uh, you know it's just going to take off the way people fear. I still feel that you know in terms of coaching clients, in terms of making clients aware of certain basic facts, I still think it's going to be predominantly face to face. But yes, you know, in, even for IFAs, in order to be able to service clients better, in order to be able to make transactions that much easier, uh, you know, they would need some kind of technology support. But I still feel that it has to be a combination of face-to-face -face with technology. If somebody comes with a belief that, uh, you know, the, the traditional channels are not going to be able to function and everything moves, uh, then I, you know, if, you, if you're going to apply the uh, so-called e-com logic to buying mutual funds, I don't think it works. And even on the e-com side, what I've seen, people stroll in the malls all over the weekend, and then they go and figure out right. what to buy. So I don't think it works. Sure. Sure. Akshay, you spoke about investor education, you know, as being a key need. And today, you know, we have, uh, you know, two basis points uh, of AEM, you know, which is, uh, which is kept aside really for uh, investor awareness initiatives. Now, uh, distributors are really. Uh, in the retail space, the best entrenched, you know, at this point of time, and that's, you know, that's what the numbers also show. Uh, in this light, uh, what do you think can be the role that they can play in, uh, you know, furthering uh, the investor awareness initiatives, uh, you know, that uh, have, uh, that 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 are a key objective, you know, for uh, both Amphi as well as for the mutual fund industry. I think, uh, firstly. Uh, let me factually correct you. Now it's one basis point yeah. given to us. Uh, two is divided at one into Amphi and one into the mutual funds. Right. So we don't have too much of a leeway. Uh, Amphi has a campaign which is a pan India campaign covering all types of cities, uh, these nomenclatures of T15, P15, and all, but it covers virtually the whole country, uh, covers all types of investors. It goes digital, it goes brick and mortar, it goes uh, into uh, normal media. So Amphi is doing a good job. Uh, so one part of our, half part of our 50% of our investor awareness budget goes to Amphi. The other 50% uh, is spent largely on a lot of collateral, a lot of digital, a uh, lot of process uh, education that we do across all funds. Uh, bulk of it, I assume, is being used smartly to actually educate. A, a shy part of, a fractional part would be probably into contests and travels. Uh, but I think the, uh, the idea is really not the two basis points. The idea is the intention of the industry to educate its customers. Right. And for that, even if you need to spend a large part of your PNL uh, as an industry, I'm saying, uh, it is well worth the effort because eventually, to me, that's the great wall of China and India. I think you, we have the products, we have the investors, somebody's got to make them meet. All this noise about disintermediation or intermediation is unnecessary because every manufacturer needs an intermediary to reach out to the distributor. The intermediary color and quality can change, but you need an intermediary. And therefore, the intermediation efficiencies can be different. Intermediaries training and skills can be different. But at the end of the day, they are the ones who have to take the products to the customers or the investors. We need to partner with them through our balance sheet and P&L individually to ensure that they reach out to their investors in the proper manner. I just gave an example of an alternate product like NCDs. NCDs as a product or company fixed deposits, I'm sure all of you who've sold company fixed deposits these deposits are available in smallest possible towns through all possible channels. 
therefore it's really about educating the investor about the advantages and pitfalls of these products that we sell as an industry and being able to partner with the intermediary to reach out to the distribution fraternity, to the investor fraternity. Please realize that the entire AMC industry would be not more than 10,000 people. So 10,000 people can't reach out to billions of people in India uh, without intermediation. So any effort that we do, whether it's customer awareness or customer facilitation or final execution has to be hand in glove with the intermediate. So to my mind, all efforts that we do, uh, we should involve, we try to involve uh, intermediaries as much as possible. Uh, but I think still a lot of uh, effort can be made uh, to do a consultative process in terms of reaching out more efficiently. Uh, the, uh, if you just multiply 16 lakh crores with two basis points, uh, it, it's a lot of money, it's 3,000 crores. Uh, that kind of money uh, should be more consultatively used. Uh, and and, and intermediaries, intermediaries as partners are, uh, are more than welcome, to my mind, uh, to, to share their suggestions because this is as much a part of their budget as it is ours because, to, to my mind, we own, co-own, uh, the final investor. Neither the distributor owns the investor nor the manufacturer owns, owns the investor. I think both of us jointly and responsibly own the investor. Yeah, as, as you rightly mentioned, it's all really a matter of growing the size of the pie. Uh, Ravi, uh, uh, you know, a lot really gets spoken about, uh, you know, the, the fees that are being paid, uh, you know, to distributors. Uh, very little, however, really gets spoken about the margins, you know, for distributors. I mean, uh, you know, Ashish also spoke about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the retail uh, penetration, especially the, the truly retail uh, piece of it. Vishal spoke about segmentation. Uh, what are your thoughts on margins? I mean, uh, given the fact that, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 in, in the retail space, it is really a matter of, uh, you know, spending a good amount of money to reach each individual customer. And given the fact that ticket sizes are not big, are people really making money uh, in the retail space? And what can really be done better? Can technology be used better? You know, are platforms uh, or exchanges really the answer? I mean, what can really be done better? Given the environment, you know, where fees are coming down, and we also really need to reach the end retail investor. Well, I think uh, the short answer is uh, we don't control this market in terms of our margins. Uh, competition does. Competition from manufacturers, competition from fellow advisors, competition from fellow channels. But perhaps not just in India, but all over the world, the regulator as a disruptor to existing models, particularly post-2008 financial crisis, not just in India, but all over the world, has been the most significant uh, change to uh, this particular industry. Upfront loads, which were there, was a significant contributor to margins in this business. And when it was taken away, it was widely felt that the impact would be so significant that it's going to destroy this industry. But just yesterday, we were hearing the number of registrations, uh, ARNs have gone up. Uh, the number of employee registrations have gone up. Uh, the absolute volume in AUM from the time when there were upfront loads was exactly half of where it is now. So on one hand, you can argue and say the reduction in costs has led to an increase in demand. But then how do you rationalize the increase in the distribution channel? which could mean one of two things, that A, all of us have to adjust to a declining margin environment, and things will only get more and more competitive. With all of us, the beauty of this business is that once you set up that basic infrastructure, then that ability to manage scale is kind of inbuilt. 
getting that ability and that efficiency requires investments. It may not be as intensive as it is in, in other areas. And I just want to say this, that this is exactly the same in various different markets. In the UK, for instance, arising out of wider EU rules, uh, they did a review of retail distribution. Retail distribution review was the name of the commission. And the sentiment or the hypothesis was that this high cost is leading to this particular lack of interest from potential investors. You bring down cost, demand will go up, is an economic theory. However, when fees are embedded, there is a lack of transparency and people don't know how much they're paying. So as Michal earlier explained, let's segregate the two. So it's a sentiment which regulators have all over the world that there must be increased transparency. And I think purely from a end user perspective, all of us all the time demand greater disclosures from everyone. You know, if you're a democracy, you want greater disclosures. You, as an individual, we see greater disclosures. So that's a trend which is here to stay. It may take some time before it finally manifests itself. But my reading of what happened in the UK is that when this such an event has taken place over the last few years, along with the cost of compliances, there has been a withdrawal from the lower end of the marketplace in terms of individual AUM. In a country like ours where we are looking to deepen and widen the uh, investor base, how do we manage that inherent contradiction? One hypothesis is that you don't worry about it. Someone else will come and fill that gap at a lower cost than what we can do. If we can't manage the cost, then someone else will do. Because business opportunity in this country or any country will always be fulfilled by some entrepreneur. That may be in the form of technology, it may be a form of robo-advice, but someone is there to fulfill that gap. The other view is if people's awareness is so limited at this stage, can robo-advice or any alternative form of advisory model fulfill it? It is still difficult to say. The view in which we keep reminding ourselves at all times is that we are in a business of manufacturing where you can take it for granted there is no margin expansion possible. So any business plan, any projection is completely based on the premise that our revenue growth has to be greater than our expense growth. That's a, that's a, that's a guiding principle which everyone in this industry or perhaps everyone in financial services has to maintain. That is again based on the premise that the pie will grow. And in India, at least we are fortunate that we can state that with a level of confidence. That's a fairly good assumption to make. But let us accept there will be disruption, there will be regulatory diktat, be it in capping expenses or even further encouraging other alternative channels to come up. All of these changes will be there in place, irrespective of whether it affects me negatively and I don't like it, but tough luck, that's the environment we'll have to deal with. Sure. I'll perhaps ask uh, one final question, you know, before we uh, throw it open to the floor, for, you know, for questions. Uh, Vishal, uh, maybe you can answer this. Uh, you know, so uh, there's been a lot of talk about the need for an SRO, you know, self-regulatory organization for distributors. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you think that's going to be useful? I mean, there's also a lot of talk about uh, having a separate uh, regulation really in the distribution space. I mean, so, you know, do you see an SRO really uh, helping the industry? I think the idea of an SRO is a powerful one. And if we go back to our own experience, not that Amphi is an SRO, but just organizing all the manufacturing activity together under a forum like Amphi, and what that's allowed us to do over the last two decades. I think that's a good case in point of say, what could be the benefits of getting distribution more organized? Because at the heart of what we've been saying, you know, there is an opportunity, we all agree violently towards that. We also think that, you know, yes, distribution will be extremely critical for us to grow this industry. I think all of us have talked about how that is the last mile connect which will get us the awareness, the, the uh, contact with the new customer that we all want. The question now is how do we accelerate that? And 
if, if there are some thoughts around how if we get the best practices together, we organize, share some learning, some opportunities, some resources like we've done in Amphi now, could that potentially organize the industry towards a faster growth rate? I would think absolutely yes. Uh, so we are quite hopeful in, 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 in seeing how that idea develops. It's definitely sure. a very powerful idea. And I think, uh, you know, if I were a distributor, I, I would think that that would be a welcome step uh, to, to get all the common uh, areas, whether they are concerns, opportunities, challenges, uh, organized in a format that makes it far more productive for everyone, whether it's a distributor, manufacturer, regulator, all the, all the customers, the end customers. So I think, uh, yes, that's something that we would uh, hope uh, would give the industry a positive fillip. Sure. So, I mean, if we could have some questions from the floor as well. Yeah. If you could also identify yourself. If you're from SEBI, tell us up front that you're from SEBI. <laughs> we'll change the tone of our answers. Uh, my name is Siddharth Shroff. I am an IFA individual financial advisor. My question is, how is this October going to, uh, October CAS uh, declaration going to affect uh, the uh, distributors who are, uh, who are the distributors who are three, four years into mutual fund services? Because a big, big uh, IFAs won't be affected because they already have built the AUM. So how, how, how is it going to affect this October 1st deadline of uh, declaration of commission structure affect the IFAs? I don't think it's, uh, I'll take that. Uh, I don't think it's going to really affect the IFAs if uh, the trust your customers have on you uh, is tenable. So what, you know, my friend Ravi was telling me, us about the RDR in England. I'll tell you the funny part of the RDR. The RDR started in late 2010, completed in 2013, and what it threw out was that after all these expense cutting mechanisms forced by the regulator, uh, cheap advice being the theme in the UK, 54% of the respondents in the investor community actually did self-mis-selling. So to cut out the intermediary and to try and do something yourself resulted in mis-selling for majority of the respondents. If you are giving the right advice at the right time and considering all that an investment advisor needs to do for your investors, he may be taken aback initially when he sees those numbers. But believe me, if your advice is truthful, if you have done the right things over a period of time, this non-discretionary spend that we consider as investors in India especially, will eventually turn discretionary. Because you are dealing with bulk of your life, your wealth, your savings is bulk of your life. We don't mind paying 2,000 bucks for one minute for, to, to a specialist doctor. Today in Bombay, if you go to a specialist doctor, within one or two minutes, he charges 2,000 rupees. But we are very, very upset if we pay 20,000 rupees to our investment advisor who services us the whole year. So I think over a period of time, if you think that you've done the right thing and if the investor has benefited from your advice, this non-discretionary behavior of Indian investors who think they are fund managers, mostly everybody thinks that they are fund managers, will turn into discretion, and this has happened across the globe. And this direct model, model where intermediaries are cut out, eventually boomerangs, and this vicious cycle comes back. So my sense is that initially there will be a bit of uh, unsettlement on the part of the investors, where they will uh, look at those numbers and be skeptical about the worth of, of your advice. But over a period of time, they will understand that this advice meant a lot to us and it, hurt, it helped us gain much more by paying that little sum of money. Good evening. My name is Amit Garg. Uh, when we are talking about uh, performance disclosure from the AMC side, 
so why not uh, since nowadays lot of focus on the ifas intermediaries distributor consultants also so why not there should not be any kind of tracker for them also they need to also disclose what they they have advised to their clients and the which scheme or which mutual fund they need to invest and after one year three year period what is the performance from their side when they are uh, supposed to collect the uh, commissions and fees so they need to also disclose So this is disclosure uh, by the IFS. The IFS. IFS. So there has to be consolidated um, figures uh, captured by the MFE or the mutual fund industry all together under the unique code of the IFA, and somebody should disclose. Okay. Because IFS are not going to disclose the fair uh, truth uh, from their side. Yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting uh, thought, and if I can just. Uh, try and uh, respond to that. I mean, see, end of the day, the relationship, and this is uh, a panel that we talked about, you know, moving from transaction to relationship. I would think the relationship between the IFA and the client is one of trust and is based on the principles of knowledge and expertise, right? Now, to my mind, any IFA who is trying to build a business or a relationship, if he were to do something that is short term in nature and pushes a product that may not be appropriate, then frankly, what's the point of, you know, doing a post-mortem of that by an industry group three years later to say, oh, actually this was right or that is wrong. In most cases, and I don't know, you know, many IFAs over here may have hopefully not seen the situation, but if you made a mistake, you would have seen the situation that, you know, like, like a famous Adman once said, the uh, customer is not stupid, she is your wife. So the customer is quite smart. You know, if you've done something that is not work, it is very likely that the customer is moving out. Now, yes, at an individual uh, client level, of course, this confidentiality would not allow people to know who exactly has said what to whom in an in a advisory standpoint. But I think one of the things we've seen quite regularly in the industry is that Products that have performed have seen growth. Products that have not performed over a long period of time have not seen growth. So to that extent, some amount of this balancing keeps happening in a natural basis. To, to, therefore, what I'm saying is that, to my mind, this exact thing is actually happening on the ground in any case all the time. Clients see advice or you know understand the advice. If they don't see it working, they move away. And Advisors, again, similarly see advice from or, you know, information coming from the manufacturers and they don't see that shaping up the way they anticipated it to be, they move away. So there is a, a, a self-check or a balance built into the system which may be effective. Uh, of course, there is, uh, you know, including a, a fair amount of research that's available in the industry about, uh, you know, who's performed, who's not performed who's gathered assets, who's not gathered assets, including at IFAs and distribution level, which is also available, which is also an indicator of, of what's been happening. I don't know if that addresses your question. No, uh, no, I think uh, you have a um, justification in your points, but I don't agree. I, I think two, three years down the line, you will see this thing also will happen. Because if you are saying that customer will invest and then after realize that uh, this is not the correct advice or uh, he has uh, missold or uh, cheated, by, and every customer, so there are enough customers, and it will be round robin kind of things. So there has to be disclosure in place by the IFA if he is charging upfrontly. Thank you so much. So we also have one question, you know, which has uh, come in uh, on Twitter. Uh, so it's it's quite open ended. How can distributors be useful to AMCs in these exciting times? So, Ashish, you. No, so I think uh, in these uh, discussions, uh, what needs to be kept in mind is that uh, it's not about distributors being useful to AMCs. In these exciting times. In these times. Yeah, exciting times. But the question is that AMCs and distributors both are working for investors. And as long as distributors and AMCs are relevant to investors, then they'll have to obviously uh, work together. But to answer straight, uh, the simple point is that uh, you see from an investor's perspective and you see their financial life. 
you know, so they need, uh, obviously they need to deal with a bank for their checking accounts. They need mortgages. Uh, they need general insurance. They need life insurance. They need to be, buy bonds, uh, equities, mutual funds. So what happens is that in an investor's financial life, there are like so many products. In every product, there are 40, 50, like we have 25 insurance companies, 45 asset management companies, uh, dozens of issuers of credit cards, and so many people giving out mortgages. So the point is that if you look at it from an investor's perspective, you know, he wants a completed car. And let's say someone like me is making engine components. So, you know, everybody who's making engine components and tires and steering wheels and upholstery, we all can't be landing up outside the investor's door to service him uh, on our own. You know, so I, as a manufacturer, I see the distributor as more like an assembly plant. So if I'm offering one of the components, then my plant should be next to the assembly plant, not outside the customer's door. So I don't see how, uh, I don't see how, you know, someone like us, you know, we manage only equity funds. Within equity, we have three funds. And I don't see how we can actually end up servicing all the customers that we want to service if we don't work with uh, distributors. The other important point is that, generally speaking, uh, if customers are left to their own to buy mutual fund products, uh, basically it's Microsoft Excel. You know, they will actually do a descending sort on one-year return and buy what did well uh, in the last one year. And I don't think that is going to help uh, anybody. You know, because when you're buying performance, you're buying the outcome. Uh, the outcome always depends on the process. So what you should ideally be buying is the process, not the outcome. You know, because if you're buying outcomes, you're chasing your own tail. And I don't think that will get anybody anywhere. So I don't think that, you know, AMCs can function without distributors. I don't think investors should be allowed to function without distributors because they end up buying, uh, misbuying, actually. Uh, that's the big challenge. Sure. Sure. So I think, uh, you know, we are also, you know, through with time. Uh, I think the central uh, theme, you know, that emerged was really, uh, you know, that the distributors and asset managers really need to complement each other. Uh, and it's really a matter of growing the pie and not really competing with each other in any manner. Uh, I would like to thank uh, you know, my panelists. I think uh, it was quite an insightful uh, session. And uh, thank you, uh, the audience, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vidyadharan. I'd now like to invite on the desk Mr. Aman Khanjdeya, Director, Conferences, Times Conferences Limited, to present each of our panelists with a memento as a token of our appreciation. Thank you, Mr. Menon. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Thank you, Mr. Vidyadharan, for moderating the panel. Thank you, Mr. Somaya. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor. Once again, I'd like to thank all our panelists through all the three panels for some very insightful discussions. A big thank you to our partners Title partner, Reliance Nippon Life Asset Management, powered by HDFC Asset Management. Associate partners, Birla Sun Life Asset Management and Live Webcast partner, and ICICA Prudential Asset Management, and our Live Webcast partner, 24 Frames Digital.